Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These questions and comments typically come from the comments on the videos that are posted on YouTube and on Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, what was the first Linux distro that you used? So this is actually a really tough question to answer because although I switched to Linux, back in 2008. I switched to Linux in 2008, moved from Windows. Linux became my primary operating system. It's the only operating system I've ever used on any of my personal machines since 2008. But I had used Linux probably well before that as far as like back in the mid to late 90s, I was using Linux occasionally on servers, you know, web servers, things like that, building my own websites. Pretty much the web always has run on Linux servers. What was I using for those? I don't know, probably Debian, probably Red Hat. I'm sure I used many uh, Debian and Red Hat servers well before I ever switched to Linux on the desktop. Probably some SUSE in there as well. As far as desktop Linux distributions though, uh, probably Prior to me switching to Linux full time in 2008, I had tried Linux on the desktop, you know, before actually making the switch. You know, really popular Linux distributions, especially in the early 2000s, would include things like Mandrake was very popular. Uh, PC Linux OS is another one that was kind of popular. A lot of the RPM distributions were very popular, say, 20 years ago, where they kind of fell out of favor around 2006 or so with the rise of Ubuntu. Ubuntu uh, exploded on the scene around 2006. Of course, Ubuntu is based on Debian, and that led to the rise of all the Debian-based and Ubuntu-based Linux operating systems that came out of that. And the very first Linux distribution I used when I made the switch full time to Linux on the desktop was actually Ubuntu. That would have been Ubuntu 804. It was an LTS release of Ubuntu called Hardy Heron. But prior to me switching to Ubuntu in 2008, you know, all the distributions I had tried on the desktop prior to that, just testing them out or, you know, things I'd used on servers. I have no idea. So I don't really think I can give you a definitive answer as what was really my very first Linux distribution. And the next question is, hey DT, do you earn money from the ads on your YouTube videos when your video is Creative Commons? I also want to create Linux content in my native language and wanted to know if I could earn if the video is Creative Commons. So yes, you can license your videos under a Creative Commons license on YouTube, and that's what I do. Every single video on the DistroTube channel is licensed as Creative Commons. You're free to use my videos uh, as long as you give me credit. You have to give me some kind of attribution. That's part of the Creative Commons license that I chose. But essentially, you're free to do whatever with my videos. I really don't care. You don't have to worry about getting a copyright strike or anything. Do whatever you want with my videos. Just, you know, please, you know, put a link to the original video if you can. Uh, that's just something you should always do anyway. That's just not necessarily a licensing thing, but being a responsible person in media. <laughs> Typically, you want to source your material. So if you're using somebody else's video, whether they require attribution or not, you probably should always give an attribution. So it really doesn't matter if you choose a Creative Commons license or the standard proprietary YouTube license for your videos. It doesn't matter. Ads are going to play on your videos. You're going to get paid for those ads. The licensing has absolutely no effect on anything. Moving on to the next question. Hey DT, could you do a video series about configuring NeoVim like you did with Emacs? I like that idea. I may actually do something like that in the future. I'll try to make a note of that and, you know, hold, hold my feet to the fire in case I forget. If, you know, a few weeks go by and you haven't seen any NeoVim content, uh, you guys in the comments section of the videos just remind me. But I like that idea. I will say the reason I haven't done it so far is because NeoVim and Emacs, they're really quite different in the fact that the reason I did the configuring Emacs series is because Emacs has to be configured just the way Emacs is out of the box. It's not really configured in any way. You have to go in and essentially write your own custom text editor, right? That's what an Emacs config is. Emacs is its own programming language. And then in that specific programming language, Emacs Lisp, you have to essentially write your own text editor, write your own IDE, right? You have to configure Emacs where NeoVim, really without any configuration at all, NeoVim is a damn good text editor. <laughs> like, yeah, I can use NeoVim without configuring it 
at all. I can't use Emacs without configuring it. So that's, you know, the difference between the two, but I don't mind actually going through and doing a series of videos on configuring NeoVim. So yeah, watch the space. Next question. Hey DT and community, do you know an easy to use folder sync tool like OneDrive on Windows? Yeah, actually there are a lot of really good cloud solutions for file syncing. Uh, some of them open source, some of them proprietary. Obviously you say you're familiar with something like OneDrive on Windows. I would look at cloud solutions such as Nextcloud. You know, just set up a, a Nextcloud server. Typically you can go get some pretty cheap hosting for, you know, $5 a month or whatever ever set up your own next cloud server and now you've got a uh fully open source cloud solution for syncing files between various machines and it's completely your cloud server. So maybe check out Nextcloud. I've done a few videos on Nextcloud in the past. You could also use proprietary solutions such as Dropbox. I haven't used Dropbox in many, many years, but it would certainly be a viable thing to use. Uh, if Megasync is still around, that's another one you could probably use for something like that. Another really good open source solution is SyncThing. I did a video recently about SyncThing and it is a fantastic solution. It's not quite as powerful as Nextcloud, but SyncThing is definitely a lot easier to get into than Nextcloud. Moving on, the next comment here was taken from the video I did about uh, people voluntarily installing spyware on their computer. Basically, people are installing these spyware programs and it's completely out in the open. This is a piece of spyware. It's going to track the sites you go and visit. Uh, basically, it's for people that have uh, like porn addictions and things like that. One of the uh, programs on that video that I talked about was a program called Covenant Eyes. And I thought it was one of the most evil kinds of pieces of software that I've ever heard about. It's basically, hey, this is a piece of spyware. You guys need to install it on your machines. That way, anytime you do something that's kind of questionable from a moral standpoint on your computer, uh, basically other people can watch you and shame you <laughs> and tell you not to do that. Anyway, this guy writes, hey, DT, you should make a video about how some Linux distros track user activity too. So... So, and the way he wrote this, I'm assuming he's saying that I shouldn't have a problem with those spyware programs like Covenant Eyes because certain Linux distros have some analytics baked in, like they're tracking uh, some user activity, maybe they're uh, monitoring uh, your computer hardware as far as, you know, some, some of these distros have analytics. You agree to send some telemetry back to, for example, Debian or Ubuntu or Fedora or whatever. That way they know who is running their uh, operating system as far as hardware. They want to know what kind of CPU you have, what kind of GPU you have, yada, 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 what kind of monitor resolutions you're using. And now, is that the same as these spyware programs? Obviously not. Like it is, that's a false equivalency. That's not any, also these uh, telemetry things that are built into our Linux distributions almost always are opt in or even if they're opt out well at least it's opt out you can opt out it's not necessarily like calling that stuff spyware is a little disingenuous because there's real spyware out there there's really harmful things out there that when you start calling things spyware that aren't really spyware you're kind of you're minimalizing <laughs> a little bit of the true spyware out there. You're kind of giving real spyware a pass when you start calling things that aren't spyware, spyware. Next up, hey DT, what is your favorite Linux command? Uh, Emacs possibly? <laughs> I mean, that's the probably the program I launched the most would be Emacs, maybe Alacrity, my terminal. I'm in a terminal all the time. Uh, and other than that, the web browser. I mean, those are the, the three programs I open most of the time. Emacs, my terminal and my browser, right? But realistically, I think they're talking about shell commands. When he asks, what is your favorite Linux command? He's probably talking about what's your favorite shell command. And that gets a little deeper. Uh, I would say uh, as far as just the things I type the most in a terminal, CD and LS. That's pretty much everybody's two most common commands. If you open a terminal, spend any time in the bash shell, the two commands you enter the most will be CD and LS, but if you're talking about favorite Linux commands as far as command line programs that I think are fantastic, that I love, that just, you know, I, I use them all the time. I really love grip, sid, and awk. <laughs> like you can do so much with just grip, sid, and awk. You could practically write any bash script to do anything you can imagine with simply using grip, sid, and awk. 
Moving on. Hey DT, you make me love Linux. I have always wanted to switch to Mac, but every time I come back and watch such videos. So he watches a lot of my Linux videos and Linux of course is fantastic. He sees all the really cool uh, customizations, uh, the flexibility you get with the Linux operating system. And he says, you know, I'd like to switch to Mac because I hear Mac is cool, but you know what? When I see such videos about Linux, I can't switch to Mac because Linux is awesome. And I, you know, this really makes me happy. This is the reason I do this kind of content because if I've somehow prevented somebody somewhere from switching to Mac, I'm happy. Next up, hey DT, I think I figured out what your super secure password is. It's so I'm pretty slick with my passwords. I know a lot of you guys really think you know what my super secure and complicated password is. A lot of people, yeah, you guys think my password is but my password is actually and the final question for this edition of Hey DT is, Hey DT, I'd like to hear your thoughts on banning Russians from contributing to the kernel, please. So recently, the Linux Foundation has banned all the Russian devs that had contributed to the Linux kernel that were regular contributors to the Linux kernel. And this is due to U.S. sanctions against Russia. There is a presidential executive order that basically says that any of these Russians that are working on GPL software, which the Linux kernels GPL software, uh, they can no longer work on that software. So it's one of those things that really doesn't matter what my thoughts on it are. It's a legal thing. Like the Linux Foundation has to ban those people. There's no way around it. There's, there's nothing they could do about it, right? So it's one of those things. I know people get angry about it, but there's no reason to get angry about things that you really have no control over. We have absolutely no control over this executive order that Joe Biden wrote. Uh, if he wants to ban those people, put sanctions on certain Russian organizations and some Russian people, he can do that. Uh, my thoughts on that. I think that's a terrible thing to do as far as these presidents that sign these executive orders and sanction Russian companies as well as Chinese companies, the U.S. especially. We sanction Russia and China a lot. And to be fair, Russia and China sanction us a lot because these countries, these three big, powerful countries, the U.S., Russia, China, and we don't always agree on certain things. So we keep levying sanctions against each other. It's gotten to the point where like half the companies in China, I can't do anything with. I can't buy their products. If I was a businessman, I couldn't be in business with them in any way. And this goes back to like the 1980s, the U.S. especially. You know, we were just banning certain Chinese companies back in the 80s and 90s. And of course, it's 2024. We're still doing that. So it's gotten to the point where there's just so many Chinese companies you can't do business with. Same thing with Russia. Now, Russia has been a little different because when I was a kid, of course, the Soviet Union was a big thing. So we just didn't do business at all with the USSR. But, you know, in 1990, 1991, whenever the, the fall of the Soviet Union happened, uh, Russia became, you know, Russia. You know, I, I thought all of that was over. Like now we could start doing business with Russia, but it, it quickly devolved into Russia and the U.S. still not necessarily friendly to each other. So we keep getting these sanctions and I hate it because there are certain products in Russia and China from certain companies in Russia and China. You know, I, I can't go get those products and it pisses me off because it serves no purpose. These sanctions, these national sanctions don't really hurt anybody. They don't help anybody. It's, it's almost like they're pointless. And all it does is create this unnecessary drama, this unnecessary heartache, like what's going on with the Linux Foundation and the kernel. And yeah, I hate that, right? I, I, I would strongly urge like future presidents, like if I was the president, I would never put sanctions in place the way they do. I, I, again, I just think that is totally pointless, especially in today's world where nations, I know we have separate nations, we have borders, but really the world now is really kind of one place. It's all one community. It's all one marketplace. And we can't we can't be placing these sanctions on various countries like we did, say, 40, 50 years ago. Now, specifically with what the Linux Foundation did, again, they had no choice. But I think part of why he's asking this question, there was some controversy around the way the Linux Foundation and especially the way Linus Torvalds handled this situation because they banned all these people. They were kind of slow in actually putting out a real statement about why it was happening. Like they just didn't come out like they should have. They should have come out and said, hey, 
it's a law. We had no choice. We didn't want to do this. You know, we're sorry about it, but we have to do this because these sanctions, you guys from Russia that over the years contributed, you know, thousands and thousands of commits to the Linux kernel. I want to thank you for your contributions. You guys are great. It was a pleasure working with you guys. I hope in the future one day we can all come together again and, and once again, work on Linux and free and open source software. But right now that's just not possible. Like that's the kind of statement the Linux Foundation should have put out. That's the kind of words that Linus Torvalds should have been telling people. But Linus Torvalds got angry. He started calling people trolls. He started calling the people that were complaining about being banned trolls, and he just wanted them, them to go away. And he made some kind of statement about how, because Linus Torvalds is from Finland, he really doesn't like Russian people anyway. It was it was a total and complete clown show <laughs> the way Linus Torvalds handled that situation. But Linus Torvalds, He's a unique individual, right? He's a very special human being. I've complained so many times in the past about the way Linus Torvalds handles things. He has a serious anger problem. He comes across as a very nasty, mean-spirited person. You know, unlike Richard Stallman, I have complaints about Richard Stallman. I've complained about the way Stallman acts sometimes in public, but he comes across as, you know, just kind of weird. Yeah, He comes across as eccentric and obviously slightly autistic like when stallman does weird things in public he's not out there trying to start shit right he's he's not out there trying to demean people and belittle people you know linus torvalds oftentimes takes things past an appropriate point especially for somebody that works on a project as important as the linux kernel because think about all of the billions and billions and billions of dollars that all these corporations make on the linux kernel hundreds of millions of dollars being contributed to the linux kernel and the linux foundation every year i mean essentially linus torvalds is the ceo of a million dollar if not billion dollar kind of corporation and the linux foundation he needs to act better, right? He does not act in a responsible or a professional way. And that's my, been my take on that for years. And this past incident with the Russian sanctions uh, kind of confirms that, unfortunately. Now, before I go, I want to thank a few special people. I want to thank the producers of this video. I want to thank Matt, James, Steve, Armor Dragon, Darloff, Daedalus, GDR, George, Lee, Matthew, Methos, Erion, Paul, Peace, Archer, Vador, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Roland, Soul Astry, Tenwin, War, Gentoo, and Ubuntu, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode of Hey DT would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work, want to see more videos about Linux and free open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace, guys.